All right, folks, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Lauren Henley. I'm the community historian here at the Western Heritage Center. We're really excited to welcome you guys in and to partner with the Yellowstone uh, Beekeepers Association for this presentation uh, because this isn't the normal audience for us, right? Um, it, it's really interesting for us to always get new faces into our building. Our building, of course, is 120 years old this year. Uh, the Western Heritage Center is, of course, 50 years old this year, and we are really excited and love telling all the stories of Montana and the Yellowstone River Valley, including agricultural stories. So of course, uh, some of you might remember last year we hosted an exhibit called Bee Between the Lines, Bees and Their People. Uh, so this is something that really kind of goes right along with us. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of information. Restrooms are down the stairs, down the hallway, so of course we got to take advantage if anybody needs to take care of that while they're here. I also wanted to give you a heads up, we do have uh, walking tours all this summer, including a tour tonight at 6 p.m. around South Park, it's called the South Park Stroll. Really exciting, there's still room in that tour if anybody would like to sign up for it, tickets are $10. Tomorrow we're hosting a brand new walking tour of Riverside Park in Laurel. Uh, so we're expanding those walking tours outside of Billings, it's going to be really great. Uh, that tour starts at 10 a.m. and is also $10, and I believe there's still room in that tour as well. Uh, so I am just going to turn the microphone over to Megan, who is with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. I, I've said it wrong six times today, so I'm really glad I think I got it right that time. Um, and we're going to learn all about bats, and I think it's going to be awesome because there's a bat skeleton up here, and I can't wait to hear about it. So. Thank you. So I'm Megan O'Reilly, I'm a wildlife biologist with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and I'm based out of Lake Elmo and this is Cora Selden, she is my intern, uh, she's from Texas, here for the summer, wonderful intern. Uh, so we do not have any bats in Montana that are actually pollinators and so I, had, I tasked Cora with putting together a small presentation on bats as pollinators in other places. Um, the, the presentation I'm going to give is kind of a standard, it's kind of bat 101, if you know a lot about bats it might be kind of elementary for you, uh, but there's a lot of people who don't know hardly anything about bats, so good place to start. So I'll run through this and then Cora will go through the pollination stuff and then we have this whole table of goodies up here, we've got handouts for the folks that are here, you can take whatever you want off the table in terms of handouts and there's bat house plans and we can talk more about that at the end and we will showcase some of the stuff for the folks that might be watching online as well. So we'll start with some basic bat questions. So if you think about a bat wing, would you expect it to be more like a human hand or a bird's wing? Anyone? Human. What was that? Human. It is. It's very much like a human hand. You can see in this illustration that they have all the digits that humans have as well. It's pretty neat when you look at it. It's not nearly anything like a bird's really. So do bats hatch from an egg? Anyone? No, bats are mammals. Don't we all come from there? <laughs> well, okay, that's the first time I've gotten that one. Um, <laughs> that was good. How many different kinds of bats are there in the world? Anybody want to take a guess? How many? Lots. Give me something. A hundred. A hundred, a thousand, about 1,300 different kinds of bats in the world. So lots and lots of different kinds of bats. And that's the smallest bat is the bumblebee bat, and the largest bat is the flying fox, which is a fruit-eating bat. It's a cute little bugger. So, what do bats eat? Bugs. Bugs. Fruit. fruit. Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, bugs. <laughs> Any, anything else you guys can think of? Blood. Yeah. Blood, yeah, there are some that eat blood. Anybody else have any, any lingering? Okay, so. It's just kind of a fun illustration. Bugs, we covered that one. Fruit, we've covered that one. Fish, there are some bats that just solely eat fish. Snakes and blood. <laughs> so why should we care about bats? One little brown bat, which is a very common bat here in Montana, can eat 1,200 insects in an hour. And I literally put 1,200 little bugs on that slide. Just <laughs> just for illustrative purposes. Uh, and so I live out in Shepherd and I love my bats because there's a lot of mosquitoes in Shepherd. 
It's just a picture of me with a bat. So there is, Bracken Cave is a very famous cave with a whole bunch of bats. Uh, the Mexican free-tailed bats from that cave can eat 200 tons of insects a night. That's how many bats there are. And it's really neat. They have a website you can go to and they live stream the bats coming out every night, uh, which is really cool to watch. And I'm sure they have that up and running now. And so I used elephants to illustrate the volume of bugs that they're eating. So every night they're eating that many elephants worth of bugs. <laughs> How do you think bats might help a farmer? Pest control, right. And so not only do they eat the bugs for them, but they also save them a lot of money on pesticides and things like that. So Cora will talk more about tropical bats pollinating plants. This is the only slide that I think I have in here about pollination, uh, but they help reseed things. They've inspired, vampire bats have inspired really cool medical research and treatment for different things. Um, and agave we have to thank bats for, which is tequila. <laughs> and they're cool. So, I think you know the answer to this because I just told you. <laughs> True or false? Some bats can catch up to 1,200 mosquitoes an hour. True. True or false? Bats are blind. False. So bats can see uh, just about as well as we can, uh, their actual eyesight. And then even in the dark, they, can, they don't see much better than us. And so what do you think they use to be able to hone in on those insects in the dark? Radar. Echolocation. Echolocation. Yep. And, and there's some cool stuff on the table here that we'll get into more later, but we've got some metal slinkies here that will illustrate echolocation for us later on. So how do you think a mother bat finds her pup in a cave that's pitch black? So she can only see as well as us, so she can't see. Who do you think she, how do you think she might find her, her specific pup? <coughs> yep, so it's a combination of smell and the sounds that the pup makes. And there's a really cool game that we play with kids sometimes where you give them each a scented cotton ball of a different scent, and then whoever the mama bat is gets a cotton ball, and she has to bump into them and sniff their cotton balls and try to find her, her matching bat pup. So that's a fun game to play with your kids if you have a, a, a day where it's raining and you need something fun to do. True or false, bats get caught in your hair. <laughs> so there's some kind of myth that bats it's maybe an urban legend, whatever you want to call it, that bats get stuck in your hair. I hear that a lot. And I did admittedly have a lady one time at one of my talks that said, <laughs> and apparently she had a bat in her hair, but I mean, they can see as well as we can, unless you have bugs in your hair, they have no desire to be in your hair. Um, and true or false, bats are dirty. Many carry rabies. Some do. Some do, that's correct, just like any other wildlife really with disease. Um, so bats are very clean. They clean themselves like your cat would clean itself. Um, they are very long-lived mammals and they only have one pup a year. And so people seem to think that they're a lot like mice just because their body looks kind of like a mouse and, and people are kind of classify them with mice, but they only have one pup a year and they're a very long-lived species. And so when you have a decline in a population, it's really hard to get that population built back up. And so this is just some, these are some outdated statistics, but it, it pretty much still holds true uh, for rabies. And so what you really have to look at is the prevalence as opposed to the number of cases, because the animals that we test for rabies are going to be the animals that are on the ground sick or they bit someone. And so of course, they're going to have, they're more likely to have rabies. And so skunks are actually have a much higher frequency of rabies in wild populations than bats do. And so you figure all the bats that are flying around healthy never get tested for rabies. So if you find a bat on the ground, what would you do? Would you pick it up? <laughs> you probably want to keep your pets away from it. Uh, maybe call Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. You can call over the office at Lake Elmo, but you want to make sure, no, it's not in a place where kids or pets can touch it or eat it or anything like that. True or false, bats are the only true mammals that fly. 
Yep, you're right. It's true. Only mammals can fly. The squirrels can glide. Yep, <laughs> you got it. And so we have a couple copies, a few copies of this poster up here. This is the 15 bat species that we have in Montana, and folks are welcome to pick those up. If you're watching at home or you're watching a recorded version, we do have these at Lake Elmo. You can come into the front office and just ask for a Bats of Montana poster. This is just a look at some of the places that bats will roost. So there are actually, there's a colony of bats behind that sign, um, the state of Montana Mountain View School. And then that little adorable little spotted bat is uh, in a parking garage in Billings. He was hanging in the parking garage. And so we have some at Lake Elmo that just hang out outside our door for a while. And then a couple days later, they're gone. Just kind of a resting spot. And this is a look at some different styles of bat houses. And so if folks are interested in that, we have a bunch of blueprints for the recommended by the bat house that's recommended by the Montana Natural Heritage Program. It's a four chambered bat house. And so we've got all the specs for it. Cora and I just built one. Um, it's a lot of work, a lot of materials. And then there's a couple of sheets that show you, for instance, because we're higher latitude, we want to have, you want to paint the the house darker color for thermoregulation for the bats. You want to orient it a specific direction so they have a warm enough place to stay. Um, so we have all those up here. And that's just a look. You can mount them on your house. You can mount them on a pole. You can mount them on a tree. As long as it has those, it meets those criteria for kind of microclimate. So what challenges do you think bats might face? Feel free to yell it out. Pesticides. Pesticides. Yep, killing their food source. What did you say? Sir? Humans. Humans. Yeah, well, that, that's pretty much what it all circles back to. <laughs> not, not all, but mostly. Heat. So, what was that? Heat. Heat? I'm not sure about that. In Australia, the, the fox bats will literally drop out of the street. If it gets too hot. Because they get too hot. Okay, I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah, so loss of habitat, that, that would be human caused. Most of the time. Disease. Yeah, disease. So white nose syndrome has unfortunately been found in Montana now, in eastern Montana. So we know it's here. Uh, it makes it all that much more important to conserve bats. Um, again, slow reproducing, long lived. You know, you wipe out a colony of bats, and it's not going to bounce back next year. That's for sure. Drowning hazards, so stock tanks, you know, a lot of stock tanks have little ladders that critters can get out if they climb in there, but some of them don't. Um, and so it's good to keep an eye on that if you've got stock tanks or you know people who do. Can they swim to the ladder? They, yeah, they can, they can swim to the ladder and climb out, yep, as long as they have a way to climb out. Uh, lots of prey species we covered because of pesticides. We covered white nose syndrome. Collisions, something like wind turbines um, could kill bats. Uh, there's been some studies that show that they kind of, there's not many super perfectly smooth surfaces in nature, and so um, they've done the same, like their drinking pattern when they're approaching wind turbines, and so it's possible that they think it's water and then they kind of move in too close. Exterminators. Um, so this is one that is kind of near and dear to my heart. I had someone call me a few years ago and he said, well, I, had a, I have some bats in my house. I thought, well, okay. So we talked for about 10 minutes. You know, were they in your sleeping quarters? He asked him a bunch of questions. And he said, well, there's probably five or six of them. And, and then he said, well, let me tell you the whole story, which is where it begins. And so he had hired an exterminator uh, to get rid of the bats. And I think the bats were outside of his house. And the exterminator had put up a box on the outside. And uh, as the bats came out, they went into this box and he drowned them all. And it was during pupping season, which is now. Um, so basically, you don't want to do any exclusion work on your house or get rid of bats. I mean, it's understandable if you don't want to, but you don't want to do it during pupping season because the pups can't fly. And so what was happening was the pups were all hanging up there waiting for mom to come back and moms were being removed. And so I tell this, it's not a pretty story, but I think it's important we uh, ran, a couple years ago, we ran a pest control certification course. And so the only way to get rid of bats is exclusion. There is no way, if somebody tells you they're gonna get rid of them and they're not excluding every single hole, they're not gonna, they'll be back. And so just an FYI, you know, if you have 
tell your friends. If you have someone that has bats and they're looking at pest control operators, make sure they know what the process is and what they're going to do um, to, to get them out. And you don't want to do anything until, I would say, probably September to do that to make sure all the pups are able to leave. And we also have a list over at Lake Elmo if somebody does have a bat problem and they need a, a name of an operator that operates to those standards, um, you can call there and get, get those names as well. And these are just some fun photos of bats. <laughs> we catch bats in mist nets, similar if, if folks know what mist nets are, we use them for birds as well where they fly in and they get tangled. Sometimes a challenge to get them back out. All right, so that's what I have. We're gonna switch over to Cora's presentation now and she's gonna talk about bats as pollinators and then we'll go over some of the cool stuff that we've got on the table here. Hi everyone, I'm sure you heard, but I'm Cora. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the pollinating bats. Um, although we don't have any in Montana, it's really good to know about you know what they do and how they help because you can't do it without them. Okay, so bats as pollinators. Um, I know this looks like a big scary word, but it's it's not that hard. I think we can all do it. So it's chiropterophily. If you want to practice saying it, it's it's pretty big, but you got it, chiropterophily. It's just a big fancy word um, that means pollinating plants uh, by bats. It's a specific way to refer to it. Um, all, black, all the bats I'm gonna to show today are gonna to be participating in chiropterophily, so. Um, so how does this actually work? How do bats pollinate? Um, a bat will start drinking nectar from the, the plant, it has a brush-like tip uh, on the tip of its tongue in order to reach the nectar inside the flower or the fruit. Um, and these tongues, like the tongue in a lesser long-nosed bat, um, can be up to three inches long. And you think, well, that's not that long. Well, the bat itself is only three inches long, so that's a big tongue. So then after it grabs the nectar from its first meal, it is covered in pollen, like this little less than long-nosed bat. Those bats are brown, not yellow, that's all pollen. Um, bats that, several, that visit several plants um, can get completely coated, much like this guy. Um, it, even the whiskers and the protruding nose that it has pick up those little granules of pollen as they feed. Um, so the next time you have a pollen allergy, be careful you're not this guy. That would be fun. Um, so then as the pollen-covered bat flies to its next plant for some nectar, um, it transfers the sticky pollen, it's a little bit sticky to get to its fur, and it pollinates the next plant, allowing the plant to reproduce. Um, so without these really helpful bats, Plants that they frequent wouldn't be able to repopulate as much, and the ecosystem would suffer as a result. So they're very important to those pollinating plants. Um, and this is super important, especially when a single bat can pollinate up to 30 plants in a single night. Um, it's really vital that we learn and support them. So they can cover up to 50 miles in a single night, meaning that they spread pollen much further in a, in a briefer period than maybe a butterfly or a bee could. Um, and this is important to ecosystems that are kind of fragmented, maybe by you know human uh, farms in the middle or cities. Um, a bat could just fly right over to its next meal. Um, so fragmented ecosystems are really important and being helped by bats. Um, even wind or water that couldn't reach these ecosystems could be reached by a bat, so that's helpful. Um, so not only do, oh, well, first I can show this video, if that's cool, how a bat drinks nectar from a plant, I'll pull it up. Okay. Uh, but basically, it's, like that, we talked about that brush tip tongue. It dips into this test tube that's clear so you can see uh, how it meets the nectar. And I think this is a lesser long nose bat too. So that three inch tongue is crazy. It's 
and they can hover, not quite as well as a hummingbird, but they can hover over that flower to get the nectar. And just one more flicker. Yep, there it goes. And this, <laughs> yeah, this one you can see better when it goes into the nectar, those brush tips at the end of it. So yeah. Okay, and Megan talked about this a little bit, but um, as the bats fly over those fragmented habitats like we talked about, um, they can spread uh, their seeds in their guano. Um, they spread the seeds that they collect the pollen from. This really helps reforestation and rebuilding habitats that have been lost, um, even habitats 50 miles away from a bat roost, which is amazing. Um, and they spread and pollinate so many plants important to human activity, uh, like timber trees and agricultural economy plants. Um, so with that said, here are some foods you have probably eaten pretty often. Um, which of these do you think bats help pollinate spread? Any guesses? Well, that's right. <laughs> if you guessed out there, you're right. Um, they pollinate over 500 species of plants, including bananas, cocoa, mangoes, agave, durian fruit, pretty much everything you can think of. Um, and if you like tequila, you can thank the lesser long-nosed bat, that pollen-covered one we were talking about, who is the only pollinator of the agave plant. No bugs, beetles, nothing like that, only the bat. So if we didn't have that lesser long-nosed bat, we wouldn't have any agave. So uh, their, their success of the agave is actually so closely tied to the lesser long-nosed bat that if there's a decline in population, you can tell by the other one. It's pretty cool. Um, so they also help farmers, as you can see, um, by eating insects on the plants. So not only do they drink nectar, but they also eat the insects on the plants. Um, so farmers don't have to rely on dangerous pesticides. So, um, so true or false, bats only eat fruits and nectar from flowers that smell good and have pretty colors. Um, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so that's false. Uh, bats love stinky flowers. Um, bats care about how stinky and how visible a flower is, remember that they feed only at night, they're nocturnal. So a big white flower would be much easier to see under some moonlight, like a full moon. Um, and they also search using their sense of smell. Um, so the muskier, the better. Um, smelly flowers like the durian flower um, and this yucca that you've probably seen are perfect for hungry bats looking for nectar by moonlight. So why is this? Like I said, flowers are white, um, they reflect more moonlight, they're easier to see when flying right by it. Um, you're more likely to see that than a small, pretty colorful flower. Um, so if you think about it, it's kind of like advertising to the bat, like maybe a light up sign would advertise McDonald's or something. <laughs> So, like I said, they are attracted to musky flowers. Um, the smell is created by sulfur compounds in the flower, um, and that would be pretty strong to a little bat flying by. So, um, if you smell sulfur flowers, then that's probably a pollinating flower to bats. So, all these adaptations point to um, bats pollinating them from the flowers, even the nectar. Um, flowers produce sticky, like sugary, rich liquid. You've heard of nectar before. Um, uh, but only a small amount of nectar is actually in each flower, which means the bats have to pollinate more, which helps the flower. Um, and they can drink up to 90 ounces of nectar in a night. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of plants that they're visiting and pollinating. So there are 48 total species of bats that pollinate. There are 36 American leaf-nosed bats and 12 species of flying foxes. 
Um, they're all specialized to pollinate flowers, which is called oh. <laughs> Chiroptera oh. pollinate. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty long. Um, these bats live on every continent with tropical ecosystems. So that's Australia, India, Africa, South America, and the Pacific Islands. So are, are pollinating bats at risk? Um, yes, we learned a bunch about these cool pollinators um, and how important they are to not only wild flowers and fruits, but domestic crops. Um, but they're, of course, at risk. Um, unfortunately, pollinating bats are threatened by habitat loss uh, due to fragmentation by human cause, um, as well as food becoming harder to find due to things like lawns, golf courses, and monotonous fields of crops that bats can't eat, like corn or hay or just things like that. Um, in extreme cases, uh, like flying foxes in the Pacific Islands, they're hunted because they're seen as vermin. Um, and they're often killed and their uh, roosts are completely destroyed, so. Uh, there's a bright side, we can help. Um, protecting feeding habitats and roosts are critical to their recovery, so night blooming flowers, like moon flower at the top, evening primrose and flea bane at the bottom, and the yucca that you've probably seen, um, are uh, really good nectar sources for bats to eat and it'll attract them and as you plant them they'll reproduce thanks to the bats and spread. Um, also houses. Um, you've probably seen these bat houses a lot. Those are to help uh, them roost. Um, maintaining natural habitats too like deserts and tropical forests will help bats to thrive and it'll reduce the human pressure we've put on them. Um, Bat houses are, are um, like these, also offer a roost for them that they can safely use and won't be destroyed by people if they're on the property, hopefully. Um, so, fair warning, although Montana has no native um, bat pollinators, education is absolutely the most important thing you can do to help these bats. Um, spreading the word that they're not vermin, um, that they help crops, they help farmers, um, and they restore natural ecosystems and reforest and repopulate flower populations, um, it, it can make a huge difference. Uh, for example, when word got out that that lesser long-nosed bat we talked about that um, frequents the agave uh, was the force behind tequila production, it became the first bat taken off the U.S. endangered list. So, <laughs> yeah. By, by educating ourselves and realizing what they can do, we can really help them to come back in huge numbers. So that's about it. So should we go over these? So this is a bat lunchbox, very cute. Um, so it just has everything that a bat would eat, like Megan talked about. They eat snakes and fish and bugs, and they even drink nectar. So that's pretty cool, just everything a bat would eat. And then this, uh, like Megan talked about, is a good example of echolocation. So you're gonna put it to the ear, to your ear, and then let it hit the floor. Like. And you can hear it. Oh yeah. <laughs> can I hear it? Yeah. Well, when you put it to your ear, you can hear the sound bouncing back, because this like, yeah, and it's a really good, you know, visual of echolocation, it's awesome. Um, we also have these bat monitors for like bat walks um, that we do with the Anbon Society. You can turn them on and they have like a frequency and you can hear the bats doing their calls. It's really awesome. Um, so that's pretty cool. We also have these handouts um, that afterwards you can pick up and we have them at Lake Elmo, the Fish and Wildlife and Parks office. Um, like instructions to build a bat roost home, um, some facts and criteria for bat houses, and we even have these cute little activity books for kids. Um, we also have some pollinating bat information sheets. It's really good information um, just about where they are and what they do. And we also have these cool posters that 
show you all the bat species of Montana, and you can also pick those up at. That's right. Uh, July 30th, uh, with Audubon, we have a bat walk coming up, which is really cool. I think it starts at 10 in the morning. No, it's at no. Night. Okay, it's at night. I'm just sorry. Just go to the Audubon's website. Okay. Audubon just, Center's website. Yeah, if you go to the Audubon Center website, um, the, the bat walk should be on there, and it's a really cool. We go around and we use these monitors to check for bat calls, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a really cool thing. So I encourage you all to check that out. That would be awesome. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, and y'all can feel free to come up and look at those and grab some handouts. Any questions? Yeah. What do bats do during the winter? Do they hibernate? Um, there's no food? They, they pretty much hibernate because, yeah, there's no food. You're right. Yeah. So, yes. Don't they get too hot in those black houses, like a day, like, uh, you know, 100 degrees? I think so. They're trying to sleep in that house. Don't they jump in? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll start with the last question. So, most of our bats in Montana, we don't know a lot about where they go in the winter. Uh, we have some that are in caves. A lot of them do small scale. It's not even really necessarily migration. They just change from winter roost to summer roost. Uh, most of our bats in Montana, we don't think, are migratory. Uh, the next question was the bat house temperature. So, one of the sheets that we have up here has, I mean, they actually have a mean daily temperature that you want to kind of strive for when you mount that house. So, it can get too hot. And some of the lower latitudes, they don't—they just use natural wood. They don't paint them to make it warmer. But they do like warm areas. Um, I had some in my crawl space for a while, and they were south facing and <laughs> got pretty warm up there, I think. But they were pretty happy. So. And then a question about the pollinators. You said there were no native pollinators to Montana, but there are bat pollinators. There no. To to the question was, are there? bat pollinators in Montana that are not native. Uh, there are not. We have no pollinators in Montana. So the yucca and everything like that, we're not really trying to plant bat pollinating right. species here. So the bat pollinating species. There's bats yeah. pollinating in Montana. Yes, correct. The bat pollinating species would be if you lived in a place where they had nectar feeding bats. And Cora and I were talking about that the other day. We have so many yucca and bloom here right now. And yeah. like, well, why don't we have them? And I guess it's probably a temperature thing since they're in the tropical climates. Other questions? Yes. If you live in the middle of the lanes and you build a bat house, what are the odds you're going to actually attract some bats and what kind would they be? So that's a really good question. Um, if you live in the middle of Billings and you put up a bat house, what are the chances they're going to be used? So you have to think about it. If you just put up a bat house, they're probably not going to come. I recommend putting up bat houses typically when people are excluding bats, so they already have a colony of bats there. And so you figure the bats are where they kind of want to be, and so if they build a house that looked just like yours next to your house that you've made all comfy and you're, you're used to living in, are you going to move into the house next door by choice? Probably not. And so, you know, I work with people who are trying to do bat exclusion work on their houses, and, you know, sometimes if we have enough on hand, we'll provide a bat house um, and ask folks to just follow the criteria for mounting them. Much better chance of using them. And we just started a program where we designed a form for folks to fill out when they do put up a bat house so that we can start to get a handle on how many of them ever actually get used. So it is possible if you just put one up. And I mean, there are some, you know, I think Home Depot has done little bat house building clinics, and they might not be the most likely to be used, but as Cora mentioned, the education aspect of that and having people get excited about bats. And I mean, we, we did a, a program in conjunction with Audubon where we had a bat house building day, and it was, we have this, I don't know if you can see this, this is a monstrous four chamber bat house. Uh, you guys can come up after to, for those that are here. Pretty big, pretty heavy. Um, and we had a day where we had a volunteer cut all the wood for us and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks bought all the materials and then the Audubon folks found some labor for us and then we just had a bat house building day and no one took anything home but people were great. They, bought, they brought their own drills with them and some other tools and we provided some tools and we had pre-painted them and it was a great fun day and, and Audubon kept some of them and put them up on Norms Island and then we have some to give to landowners who are excluding bats and, and need a bat house. That answered the question. Like, yeah. <laughs> I kind of got lost about what the question was. What kind of bats do we have right around here? Um, 
Uh, little brown is our most common species, but you could have little brown, big brown, as you saw that spotted bat was in a parking garage in Billings. So, I mean, really, I would expect any bats that we have in this part of Montana would be, would be possible. Yes? You said white nose syndrome, was it? Yeah, white nose Um, I can't answer that offhand. I have to look what species it was found in. Yes? How many bats will be in one of those boxes? Probably a few hundred can get in there. There's four separate chambers. And I mean, they can get in a tiny hole the size of a dime. So there's something, we didn't bring it with us today, but it's a very crude piece of plastic called a bat cone. And when you do that exclusion work, you want to close, again, after the pups can fly, what you do is you seal everything up except one hole where they can come out. And then you put this bat cone up on that hole and it's kind of angled and it's slippery plastic and they come out and they can't get back in. Um, and so it's pretty, it's a pretty small opening. It doesn't take much for them to be able to get in. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everyone for coming today and for watching at home if you're watching at home. And for those of you who are here, feel free to come up and play with our slinkies and ask questions and pick up some handouts. So thank you.